have first additional language and FAL. I am now going to just go over assignment one, having a few queries and um, off the reflections from semester one, it seems like this might help to elucidate what you should be doing with assignment one. Um, I'm going to go through the four sections required and discuss each section of clearly, I hope, and this will help you in your understanding of how to tackle the assignment. So I'm just going to share my screen quickly and um, get my PowerPoint up. Joshua, if you want a copy of this, you'll have to let me know, okay? Right, just share my screen. There we go. Um, assignment one is not about grammar, okay, and writing things in the past or the present tense or finding an adjective. It all has to do with the meaning of the text. So what is the message of the text that you were sending and how do these language structures support that message? Okay, so there's the book, my visual, and everything jumping out of it, and it's all related to that meaning. So let's look at assignment one. There's four sections to it. The first one is that you've got to select a topical and local persuasive text, a report or a magazine article that's got a picture or an image or a graph with it, okay? And it's commenting on some social circumstance. So you will get a mark for the selection of the article. And I've actually put in 2021. I want it local. It must be South Africa. And I want something that's been written this year. Um, that's going to force you to use articles, download them, and not go to past papers. So I'm going to try and make that quite specific. It can't be something that happened 10 years ago. It must be something that's happened in 2021 so far. It must be local, South Africa, and there must be a, a persuasive message. There's so many things happening that's trying to persuade the reader to be vaccinated or not be vaccinated. So these things are happening all the time. So that's your first thing you've got to do. Second thing is you're going to design an assessment. And there's going to be five things in that assessment. I'm going to go over those. And you've got to be cognizant of the cognitive thinking levels. There's not all just what and identify. There is some creative thinking in what you're asking the students to do, especially when you get to FET stage and especially for home language. Uh, then you're going to, from, from your assessment that you have designed, you're going to give me a complete and comprehensive marking guide. Um, all the things that we discussed in semester one with your assignment three apply here, that I must be able to mark that assignment, that assessment quite easily by working through your marking guide, that I will know what the marks are, the total marks, I will understand how to apply the marks, so it'll be very clear for me when I go to mark your actual assessment and one of your markers, so I must be clear when, with everything how you've addressed it in the marking guide. Then finally, it's the reflection part. You're going to have to write a little paragraph on whether you should teach grammar implicitly. That means allowing them to discover. And I discussed this in my week two um, integrated grammar um, teaching video, where you can have both. Sometimes you can go implicit, and then you can back up with, with work on it, applied exercises. Or you can do it explicitly, and then also relate back to the text as well. So I want your comment on that. And then give me five grammar teaching principles, okay? What you should do when you're teaching grammar, and then give me an example of how you could do this. So if you say, um, for instance, that you should, um, oh, I'm just trying to think of a grammar example, uh, you, you must have it related to a text. So when you, you don't teach grammar that's not integrated, it mustn't be isolated. It must be related to a text of reading, listening, speaking, or um, what's the other one? Writing, okay. Um, and then you're going to give me an example of how this can be done. All right. So let's look at assignment one and we're going to go through this looking at the text first. The first thing you want to do is go and choose a text. It's local, it's topical, it's interesting, it's persuasive. Okay. There's a visual element to it, a picture, a cartoon, a graph, something that's visual, and there is a social message. And this was all in my um, week two um, video as well, speaking out against poverty and inequality, Quality and diversity, these are all social topics. My body is not your crime scene. COVID injections, jabs, sanitizing, mask wearing, all those things. So you'll select your topic. 
that's persuasive, that's got a visual element, um, that's making a social comment. And I went to Google, my good friend Google, and there for South Africa, there are whole loads of texts that you could use um, from economic reconstruction and development, um, right to COVID-19 issues, to poverty, to discrimination and equality, to education, to conservation and pollution. Things that you're interested in, go and search, use the word report with it, South Africa, and you are going to get many, many articles, especially on News24, there are whole loads of them. Okay, we're going to rescue our country, as you can see the flag on the life boat and the life <laughs> tube, okay. And yes, another visual here we've got, we choose education, not poverty, and this could be also related to your topic. I went to Google quickly this morning, and um, this is what I found. It was about 25 minutes before today. This was one of the headings. Kretzky Hospital Board condemns anti-vaxxers disrespectful, demoralizing sentiments. And there's a visual that you could use in your text, and there's a text underneath it. This was another one on News24. POTUS kill and dehorn two white rhinos on a free state farm and they injure a third. So if you're interested about conservation, this would be the type of um, article you would choose. Um, and there's your visual as well. And then there's the article underneath it. Your social issue is very, very important. So it must be something you're passionate about. I think that's when you can really write well about something. So you've got your text now and you've got your visual. Now you're going to design your assessment and you're going to have to have five things in your assessment you can have something about visual literacy and we'll look at this just now there we go this was also taken today sunday um today is the 22nd of august and um lockdown sees 20 year record in south africa's school rate dropout um schools dropout rate so it's the most dropout we've had have you washed your hands um, and there's a whole article about this in the paper. You are now going to design questions relating to the visual literacy and how it supports the message of the text. You will look at things like the angle of the shot, the, you look at the, um, the focus of the shot, the color, and you can see they've got their faces blanked out, you can see they were in school clothes, um, and how does this support the message? So you'll have to say the questions like, um, how does using, um, blues and school uniforms affect the message perhaps of the text okay summary writing someone's just emailed me about summary writing um you're gonna have to choose a topic from the article on which they must actually write a summary i'm also going to later on in this text i'll show you what caps has said about summary writing you if you are FET or SP, there are different requirements, different lengths, um, and I'm going to give you an example of how this could possibly be done. There you go. That's a point form summary. Um, for FET, home language, you've got to do a paragraph. For SP, home language, and FAL, you can do a paragraph, or you can do a point form type summary. Um, there are different word lengths and lengths of the actual summary as well. You Got to look at registering style. So there must be a question on formality and informality. Why has it been used? Okay, not just is it formal or informal. You must say, why did they use contractions? Or why did they use um, going, get going instead of begin or commence? Um, so you have to answer questions like that. You can ask them to identify informality, but then that they must comment on its use in the text. I was making sense. Then the language structures and conventions. Um, what type of sentences have they used? Have they used mostly um, simple sentences or the compound, complex or compound sentences? What kind of punctuation conventions have they been using? So you've got to go and look at the whole structure of the way it is actually written and make a comment on the use of simple language in terms of the message that it's trying to get through. Maybe it's, it's focusing on um, younger students or younger learners, and therefore the language is simplified so they can access the message. Answer like that. And then social discourse, I'm going to go into now as well. What do I mean by social discourse? Um, this is the summary writing. Um, I'm going to go down to social discourse in my next slide. You can see I've gone to the CAPS document, and there is the grades, there's the comprehension length. So you can go and edit it. Um, if it's not 
so for grade 10, it's going to be 400 to 500 words. Um, the summary should be about 200 words. It should be a separate section. But for this task, you're going to use the same text as what you've got for the actual comprehension. But the actual summary must be 60 to 70 words for grades 10, 11, and 12. For home language, it's slightly longer. The comprehension is longer from five to 600 to seven to 800. Um, and the summary number of words, but it's the same article. So don't go and choose another text. You can do this for our, our final assignment three, and there's a number of words. For um, grades, um, first additional language, SPs, um, there's the length of the comprehension and the summary. So here's your words and your summary indications. Um, for um, FAL and um, FETs, you can do a point form summary. Um, for FET, home language, you have to do a paragraph, you can't do a point, for instance, point form summary, go and read your CAPS document. Um, and then for the SPs, both FAL and home language, you can do a point form or paragraph type um, summary. Okay. There, this is all in the CAPS document. If you need more information, I have given you notes. Um, which are uploaded with your assignment one, showing you how you can do a summary and how you can structure it. Let's go back to that note. It's on the assignment one section and you can go and read the notes. It gives you more information as well. Right, so let's go look at social discourse and their language use. This is straight from Ferreira, page 243 to 248. So you've got Ferreira, you can go and check it out. I'm giving you a summarized version here. First of all, um, for social discourse, you can look at pronoun use. And this is because it's used to include and exclude other people. So if I say we, I'm included and they are the outsiders. Okay, if I say us, I'm included and them. How does the text that you've chosen um, name the people that are different from others? Maybe the anti-vaxxers are us and those are having vaccinations are them. So we're separating ourselves from them. And how does this contribute to the message okay, of the text? Euphemism is another way for social discourse when we use language that is saying something that is not so nice in a nicer way. Okay, so we don't say someone has failed. We say they're repeating the grade. It sounds so much nicer. We don't say someone was fired. We say they've been asked to leave. So are there any euphemisms? And what is the effect of using a euphemism on the message? succumbing to COVID, dying of COVID. Okay, they are very different. One's more direct, one's more subtle. So you have to look at the impact on the message. Tense use is also part of social discourse. Um, if you use tense statements, they're often quite categorical. It's like true or false. Okay, they're straightforward, they're direct. For example, Mandela became the president in 1994. That's a categorical statement. It's yes, it's true. Um, so if you have intense in your sentences, it's making direct statements if you're using that in that form. It also shows that something has happened and when it is happening. So if I say US soldiers tortured prisoners, it means they did it in the past. Okay, they're not doing it in the, at the moment. Or US soldiers torture prison, prisoners. That's the present tense. It means it's still happening. So look at tense use. You don't have to do all of these social discourse type. You can maybe do four or five or two or three um, type questions relating to social discourse, but there must be a section on social discourse. And um, Ferreira's got eight. So if you can do four, that'll be fine. The last one is um, the, on this page is active and passive voice. Active voice gets the subject to do the actions, taking ownership of it. For instance, um, the government segregated the schools. The government is taking blame for it. It's direct. It's taking ownership of that segregation. If I use passive voice, schools were segregated. You're not saying by who. So you, you're not saying I did the action. So you're taking a back stand. You are not being direct in what you are saying. If the whole article is written in the passive voice, it's very indirect. Why are they hiding? Why are they taking ownership for what has actually happened? Um, number five is the use of conjunctions. They often add more information. So if I want to give reasons, I will say because. If they never give any conjunctions, never any reasons, it's not a very detailed article. It gives results. It gives conditions. If I say if, if I want to add information, I might say in addition or and. 
if we've got caveats, um, I might say although or despite, okay? I'm going to the other side of it, something alternative. Sentence types, you can have a statement, question and command. Um, if they're using a lot of question type information, if they're using a lot of statements, they're using command type sentences, these have an effect. So for instance, if I'm using statements all the time, if I'm the writer of the speaker, I'm giving out the information, so I'm powerful. But if you're the reader or the listener, you are needing that information, so you're not as powerful as me. Okay. If, however, there's a lot of questions in it, it means the writer or the speaker needs information, while the reader or the listener has the information. So if there's lots of questions, it's often meaning the reader has got the power. Commands, the speaker or the writer is powerful. Okay. Go and do that. I've got the power. I'm making you do it. But if you're the listener, the receiver, or the reader, you can be ordered. You are less powerful than I am. So just check the kind of sentences that are being used. Naming is how we name people and their actions and how we describe them. Um, these names often identify, give them an identity, the people, and their background to do something about where they come from. For example, Let's look at Obama, Barack Obama. This is an example from Ferreira, so you can go and read about it yourself. You can call him a US president. You can call him a family man. That's so different to his identity and his background. A smoker. Why would you call him that? Okay, there's, there's a social message coming through. Not black enough. Okay, also a social message. Fifth black American senator. Different ways you can label people and this puts their identity on them. And the last one is the visual aspect, which is your visual literacy part. Look at the shot angles. It's a high, low, side, wide type of shot. What are the, what is it a close up, a medium, a long shot? Is the focus sharp or is it soft? What is the colors being used? Um, what are they wearing? All the visual parts of it. And this creates a version of the subject that you want the reader to have. So there's eight of them, all from Ferreira, which you can use for your social discourse. Okay, this was a picture also taken today from Times um, no, UNICEF saying how children are being affected by COVID. If you look at the actual visual for this, you can see that the background is blurred out so that you can focus on these two schoolgirls, I think. The one is wearing casual clothes, the one is looks like she's wearing a tracksuit, which might be a screen uniform. They're both wearing masks. Um, she's got chips in her hand, but she must be eating somehow. Um, and they are looking at each other, one's wearing glasses. What is being captured in this picture with the whole article about how much our students' lives have changed? Okay, and this will be related to the message of the article that you've chosen as well. Here's an example that I quickly did this morning. Um, lockdown sees the, the, the previous heading I gave you. Lockdown sees 20 year record in South Africa schools dropout rate. And here's the whole article. I just cut a section of it. And you can see here's the tense use. Um, this is Muslim Diala Langa sat on a bank stool in his yard of his Orlando East home, soaking up the winter sun on Friday afternoon. Okay, he sat, that means it's present tense. This is happening to him. Um, he was soaking up the winter sun. It's, it's now quite cold at the moment. So we know this is August. Um, it's setting him, the tense is saying, what's happening now? He's not at school. He's still at home, okay? That's tense use. Then we can name him, and this is how we provide his background and his identity. And here we have him, he's 17 year old, he's a grade eight pupil, he's at Orlando High School. How does this affect the message saying that there's a dropout rate? Saying here is someone of 17, he's in grade eight, and he's one of the dropout people um, statistics. And this shows that it's a very sad case, I think that's happening. And he's still sitting at home um, instead of continuous education and perhaps progressing onto the employment market. Euphemisms, remember saying something that's not so nice in a nicer way. And in the same paragraph, they've got sitting at home and they've also got dropped out of school. Okay. Um, these are maybe euphemisms um, for saying that he's left school or he's, he's not working at home. Um, what are they? Okay, but it's drawing attention to him as well. There's also the word expelled here. Expelled is quite direct. It's not a euphemism. Maybe sitting at home and dropped out are more euphemistic than saying expelled, which is quite direct. Summary writing. For those of you that are interested in summary writing, this whole paragraph that I've 
got the summary writer next to you is a whole lot of things that he's been doing. Um, we alternated between weeks to attend school. As time went by, we alternated, we alternated between days. I made some silly mistakes like not attending classes, not doing my homework, arriving late. Um, I was taken to the principal's office a few times and had been given a few warnings. And I was going to worry about getting expelled. So your summary writing could be, um, what has um, Ms. Ms. Wandile been doing um, during this lockdown time uh, of COVID in the schools? And they could write a point from summary of what he has been doing. All right. Um, and the last thing is going to be pronoun use. And here he says, I have concerns about what they are going to do next. So he's worried about they, who or who is they? Um, is it the school? Is it society? Is it the government? And I, I am separate from they. So he's positioning himself as being separate from this body who's going to do things about getting him expelled. Okay, he wants to go to another school. So this is one, two, three, four, five things I've done using, well, it's actually four things and the summary writing just from the article as well. Okay, word use is also something you can look at. I put this in my um, week two video as well, um, where we can look at negative words being used, why are negative words being used? And remember, we looked at the word threat. We looked at a um, stay-at-home order, which we don't like. And we also looked at the whole thing of going hungry, fear, and growing hungry. These are negative things. These could also relate to your summary writing. You could write, find six negative experiences of people during this COVID time. Um, what things did Mazundili do that were not helping him stay at school? And you could find five things, whatever it might be. Positive words, remember that... Um, that the transmission has been quite slow. And the other positive thing was that um, your confirmed cases are relatively low as well. Um, so those are two positive issues in this diagram. We've also got the visual, the blurring out, social um, distancing, the use of food, um, they were in the mask, looking at the other people, they all were in masks and so on. Okay, now you're getting onto section three, the marking guide. So now you've set your, you've chosen your text You've got questions on each one of those five issues. Um, you've got the little marks, you've got your total marks, and now you've got to do the marking guide for this. And please give me a complete heading. This is a marking memorandum for each grade and link it clearly to the assessment type. Have clear instructions on it for your poor markers so they know what to do. Um, clear headings, so you can have different sections for each of those grammar sections. Clear numbering, so I can see what the numbering is. Justify, I'm sure what I mean by justify your marks to the right, so then a nice column. You're going to use the tab key to get it all nice and straight. Um, mark allocations per question. Again, don't expect them to go back to the question paper to get those mark allocations. You insert them per question again in your marking memorandum. Also put in little text to show which words or which phrases or whatever it might be will receive a mark. Don't group all the ticks together. So if it's for three marks, you put tick, tick, tick. You've got to show specifically on the text where the tick should be. Or if you don't want to use ticks, use little marks, things of one in brackets. That's also fine. As long as you show how the marks are allocated. Please, if it's just one word, don't give two marks. It's crazy. It's one word would be a mark. Don't don't load the marks like that. I can be very careful of that. A lot of you were giving like masses of marks for just saying one little thing. Um, just remember also your categorical questions like yes, no. If you got those, um, are you going to have your jab? That's just one mark, and then ask them to explain the answer. Those are the ways you get the extra two marks. Okay. Um, if you've got suggested and open answers like um, that for yes, no, I've just mentioned now. Um, please give suggested answers as well, things that they could say, because I'm scared of the vaccination, because I'm scared I'm going to die, because I've just had COVID. Those could be different answers for not getting the jab, okay? And then provide the total marks at the end as well. Maybe you can have it at the end of each section and at the end of the whole assessment. Right, um, this was also taken from how you could do um, assignment three last semester. I gave you the template. Um, where you've got the heading, the reading activity, the topic, the grade, you've got the instructions, um, then you've got the reading part, you've got the paragraphing indicated, all the lines indicated. 
Remember, um, you've got to use in-text citations. And I'm saying this again, although there is a link there, it is not the correct way to in-text citation. You've got to put this, the um, writer's name and the date. Or if you haven't got the writer's name, it's the topic. So it'd be crimes which shook the nation. And in brackets, you'd have 2019. OK, that would be the correct way to cite um, an in-text citation. If you're not sure, there is on the opening welcome part of ECI, you can go and check what the conventions are. And then the questions as well. You've got a heading which says questions. You've got a numbering system going down the left. You've got your mark allocations all under, under each other, beautifully laid out on the right. It makes it look professional. Um, let's have a look. You've got your marks in brackets. You've got sometimes you might have one plus two because you've asked them what is your opinion on Santa Celia's sentence in line 11 um, and then you explain your answer so it's one for the one one it's two marks for the other um, five is one plus three or that should be four marks to give you 15 marks the total mark and then please put lines in or paragraphs to link your question clearly to the text this makes it easier for the learners as well so they they don't have to waste time reading the whole text again. You're directing to them to where they should go and have a look. All right. And then you'll have your marking memorandum that will follow the type of questions that you have done. OK, anything's not clear, please get back to me. All right. Then finally, you're going to end up with a reflection. That's the fourth part of the assignment. Reflect on your grammar lesson activity by saying how you intend to teach it. Must you teach it implicitly and or explicitly? How will you teach it? What do you think is best? And then the five grammar principles, okay, that grammar teaching should never be isolated, should be text-based, and then the example. So <coughs> that's it. Best wishes. I see some of you already started your um, assignment one preparation. Well done. Um, and enjoy it. Okay, get back to me if anything's not clear. I hope this has made it clear. I'm not sure if it is, but um, I will upload the PowerPoint as well. If you are really in Afrikaans to say, dear Macau, confused, please get back to me. Um, don't forget your reference list as well and in text citations. Ciao for now. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday and we'll chat soon. Bye for now.